Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on empowering and enabling teachers to improve equity and outcomes for all. This webinar is leading up to the International Summit on the Teaching Profession, which begins tomorrow. It is an important forum for discussion, bringing together teacher organizations and governments. Andreas Schleicher, Director for the Directorate of Education and Skills at the OECD, is joining us today to present key findings from the background report prepared for the International Summit, compiling data from the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, as well as the Teaching and Learning International Survey. Andreas will be looking at how education systems can achieve both excellence and equity in a rapidly evolving landscape and how they can provide teachers with the necessary tools to meet these challenges. Andreas will also be available to answer your questions after the presentation. Please feel free to send your questions to Eric Magnuson using the chat function at any time during the presentation. Andreas? Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to share the uh, findings from our background report with you today. Uh, the International Summit on the Teaching Profession has been with us since 2011. It's a very important opportunity for ministers and union leaders to meet firsthand to discuss the major challenges that are ahead of us. And clearly, the challenges ahead of education are enormous. And if we want to address them with a reasonable chance of success, we'll only be able to do that collectively with social partners and also as partners internationally. That's very much the spirit in which the summit is taking place. Uh, conventionally, you know, if you think about the impact of digitalization, you know, uh, it's connecting countries, it's connecting continents, and it's also connecting fields of knowledge in entirely new ways, asking people more and more to think across the boundaries of uh, discipline. There's something with a uh, muting. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, I just got a message from someone who couldn't. Um, if you think about schools, uh, conventionally we break big problems down into smaller pieces and then teach students the techniques to solve those pieces. But today we really create value by synthesizing the different bits. And this is about curiosity, it's about open-mindedness, it's about making connections between ideas that don't seem to be related. And that is really requiring us to be open to fields in other than our own. Success, and I've marked it here on the screen, is really now about systems thinking. It's about design thinking, about information literacy, digital literacy, and also global competency. And what I mean by this is our capacity and willingness to see the world through different lenses, appreciate different ideas, value different cultures. We're all born with what Robert Putnam calls funding social capital, a sense of belonging to our family and to uh, people who have similar experience than we. But it takes really hard work in education to create the kind of binding social capital through which we can build common ground around people with diverse experiences and interests, and so which we can also increase our radius of trust to strangers and institutions. And maybe education needs to do a better job today to prepare students for a world in which people need to trust and collaborate across diversity. One thing is very clear where societies don't build floors under people, the people may reach out for the world. And I think this is something that we're all seeing happening these days. Think about digitalization. It can be incredibly democratizing. You can connect and collaborate with anyone around the world. And maybe digitalization has changed the very nature of democracy. Democracy used to be the right to be equal. Now democracy is becoming the right to be different. But digitalization can also concentrate incredible powers. Now, you can see basically uh, Google creating a million dollars for every employee. That's 10 times more than the average American company. And that's showing us that technology is creating scale without mass at a frightening pace, leaving people almost out of the equation. And that raises big questions about the future of education, too. Digitalization can be incredibly particularized. The smallest voice can be heard everywhere, but it can also be incredibly homogenizing, squashing you know, individuality, cultural uniqueness, and that, too, is a test for education. 
Digitalization can be incredibly empowering, but it can also be incredibly disempowering. Things about how we sometimes become slaves of our machine. In a way, the rolling process of automation and hollowing out of jobs have made routine tasks uh, have that's radically changing the way we employ. For many, that's been liberating and exciting, but for those without the right education, it often means vulnerable work. Here are our contracts with our benefits, insurance, pensions, or prospects. To think about how our education systems have been responding to the expanding knowledge of our times. At the OECD, we've been measuring educational progress through TISA, where we test the knowledge of 15-year-olds every three years. In 2006, we focused on science. Now, 2006 seems a long time ago, and in fact, it was the year before the iPhone was invented. In those times, Twitter was still a sound, the Amazon was still a river, and we didn't have many of the kind of technological tools we take now so much for granted. But learning outcomes in science didn't change that much. And the world continued to change. Maps became dynamic, cars became electric, now even driverless. Crowdfunding has vastly increased our individual and our collective potential. But again, you know, between 2009 and 2012, even though we have lots of young people getting better degrees, when you look at their capacity to think creatively and imaginatively and to solve complex problems, that's the red line here, we didn't see much educational improvement. And imagine just what happened since the first ISTP took place in New York in 2011, virtual reality now integrates the world's most advanced knowledge into what we do right now. Digital printing allows us to produce what we need right here. Or think about robotics, big data, cloud computing, biogenetics. But it seems our school systems did not respond, and the gap between what societies need and what schools deliver seems to be even getting wider. You know, of course, there are exceptions to this. Now, Portugal has been able to significantly improve its outcomes. And Singapore keeps advancing from good to great, but those countries are really the exceptions. And don't expect to solve that with money alone. You know, most countries uh, that are coming together for the ISTP are already well beyond the point at which money alone will yield real improvement. Or look at this. In any of the countries taking part in the ISTP, if you add one more hour in science, your students will do better in science. So that's clear. If you add one more hour of history, your students will do better in history and so on. More instruction time is a reliable predictor for better learning outcomes. But when you look at this across countries, it seems that the countries where students go to school longer actually come out worse in PISA. Now, how do you reconcile it? Within countries, learning time seems to be conducive to better outcomes, but across countries, longer hours seems to be negatively related to outcomes. Well, you know that paradox is actually not so difficult to resolve when you think about it. Learning outcomes are always the product of the quantity of learning and the quality of learning. If you focus on improving the quality of teaching, you can achieve better outcomes even with less time. And that's exactly what our data show. In blue, you see the number of instruction hours for each country, and now I add to this the number of learning outside school in yellow, now whether it's private tutoring or homework. And you see this very, very significant. In the United Arab Emirates or China, students learn for close that's to 60 hours, while in Finland and Germany, it's just a little more than half of that. And now we can calculate the learning gains per hour of instruction. That's the black diamond here. And you can see this very hugely across countries. In Finland, Germany, Switzerland, or Japan, students learn a lot in little time, while in the UAE, even 60 hours of learning seem not to get students very far. And that just highlights how much teachers and teaching really matters. And there's some interesting insights that uh, our PISA data offer on this. One of the things we have recently looked at is how different teaching and learning strategies help students solve different types of PISA tasks. You know, perhaps the oldest learning strategy is to learn things by heart. I will now put the PISA tasks where memorization helps students in the green part, 
and those where memorization is less effective in the red part. And then I'm ordering the PISA tasks by difficulty. What you see is that memorization is helpful for easier tasks, but as the tasks become more complex, memorization helps you less and less. So memorization is important, but it's not enough. We need to recognize that the kinds of things that are easiest to teach and easiest to test are also precisely the kind of things that are easy to digitize and automate. The future is more about complex ways of thinking, complex ways of doing, and collective capacity. Control strategies, so things like you know, students setting their own goals or structuring the learning processes, seem to generally enhance success on PISA. No? But also control strategies seem less effective with the most difficult PISA task. There's yet another pattern when you look at elaboration strategies, things like relating new concepts to what you already know or exploring new ways to find answers. Some people say, well, that's the holy grail of teaching. All teaching should be like this. But you see, the reality looks much more than nuanced. Elaboration strategies are exactly what you need to solve the most complex PISA tasks that require you to think like a scientist. But they actually are a lot less helpful and even counterproductive for easy tasks. So, you know, if you use project-based learning to teach students the multiplication tables, that's not going to be very effective. So the upshot of all of this is that teachers need a broad variety of teaching strategies, and that's what we see in the most advanced education systems. Let's put teaching and learning together. On the vertical axis, I will show countries high up, where countries where students place more emphasis on memorization, and countries lower down who put more emphasis on elaboration strategies. On the horizontal axis, I now show you countries on the left, where teachers tend to rely more on student-oriented instruction, and countries on the right, the teachers rely more on teacher-directed instruction. And now you will tell me that teacher-directed instruction tends to go hand in hand with memorization. Yes, there's a slight tendency in that direction. But it becomes much more interesting when you look at this by country. Some people claim that the East Asian countries teach highly teacher-directed and do little more than memorization. But look at this. Yes, they work more teacher-oriented, but their students tend to be better than the OECD average when it comes to elaboration. And countries like France, Ireland, and, or Hungary are far more teacher-focused than the East Asia. And look at countries like the UK, like Australia, New Zealand, or Israel. They work in more student-oriented ways. When, and when you ask teachers why they do so, they say that's in order to move away from rock learning. But interestingly, these are the countries where memorization seems most prevalent. And things become even more complex. When you square these results with the PISA outcomes, you see that teacher-directed strategies tend to produce better cognitive outcomes. The student-oriented strategies correlate with higher student engagement and more co positive career expectations. This shows us high, how high the demand on modern teacher professionalism Really, yes, you need a broad variety of effective teaching strategies. In the past, we could teach people for a lifetime. These days, we simply no longer know how things will unfold. Often we are surprised and we need to learn from the extraordinary. And sometimes, you know, we make mistakes along the way. And we often make mistakes and properly understood that create the context for learning and growth. We used to learn to do the work. Now, learning has become the work. And education needs to provide people with a reliable compass and the navigation tools to find their own way through that increasingly complex and volatile world that we are in. So what are the implications for our policy? In the past, it was sufficient to assault students because our economies could rely on a few highly educated people. Today, you need all learners to contribute to the world. And the results from PISA show that we can actually reconcile quality and equity. On the vertical axis, you see the quality of learning outcomes. On the horizontal axis, equity and the distribution of learning opportunities. Nobody wants to be in the lower left quadrant, no, where quality and equity are poor. It doesn't help to be in the lower right quadrant, no, where equity means everyone is learning at mediocre levels. 
Now, some countries where learning outcomes are good on average, but at the price of large disparities. It's still not ideal. But you do see countries in the green quadrant that combine high overall achievement with an equitable distribution of learning opportunities. There's another way of looking at this. On this chart, I show you the learning outcomes by decile of social background. The red square shows you the performance of the 10% most disadvantaged 15-year-olds in the Dominican Republic. And the green triangle, the learning outcomes of the 10% from the wealthiest families in that country. So you see how much social disadvantage penalize learners. But once you start to look at this across countries, you can see how widely the learning outcomes of similar students differ. Students marked by the red squares have all have the same social background. But you can see that the 10% most disadvantaged student in Vietnam or Estonia is better skilled than the average student in the industrialized world and better skilled than the 10% most privileged students in some of the countries. All of that has to do more with policy than you think. Inequality and opportunity starts early. Here you see the number of years that today's 15 year olds have gone to preschool. And that varies a lot across countries. But what's most disturbing is that students in disadvantaged schools, for whom early learning can make most of the difference, actually get the least of it. And it continues in school. If you come from a wealthy background, school does not make that much difference for your life. But if you come from a poor background, you only have one card to play in life, and that is a good education. So you, so you don't want to, you'd want to attract the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms and the greatest school leaders to the most difficult schools. But as you can see from the chart here, only very few countries succeed with it. In most countries, if you come from a disadvantaged background, you also get the less qualified teachers and the poorer educational resources. So policy does not moderate that reinforced inequality. And we can see social, wide social inequalities in teacher behavior, including that school principals tell us that teachers in disadvantaged schools are even less well prepared. Last but not least, we all promote vocational education for other people's children. But again, often vocational programs become a trap for the disadvantaged. You see that very clearly on this picture. There's so much more we need to do to make learning central, encourage engagement and responsibility, be acutely sensitive to individual differences, provide continual assessment with formative feedback, be demanding for every student with a high level of cognitive activation, and also ensure that students feel valued and included and that learning is collaborative. And traditional bureaucratic school systems sit often left alone in classrooms with a lot of prescription of what to teach. Future te teachers and schools are looking outwards to collaborate with the next teacher in the next school. We define professionalism at the level of autonomy and internal regulation exercised by members of an occupation. It means placing emphasis on the internal motivation of members and their ownership of professional practice. And that has to do with public confidence in the profession and professionals, with professional preparation and learning, with collective ownership of professional practice, with decisions made in accordance with the body of knowledge of the profession. And it has to do with acceptance of professional responsibility in the name of the profession and with accountability towards the profession. Of course, you know, policy needs to create the room for that. And that also has to do with resources. On the vertical axis here, you see the number of students per teacher. So the lower your country shows up, the more teachers your country invests. On the horizontal axis, you see the class size. You might think that student-teacher ratios and class size should somehow be related, but countries are all over the place. Compare the United States and China. Both countries invest a similar share of teachers. The class sizes are much larger in China than they are in the United States. Smaller classes seem fashionable, but it means that teachers in the US have very little time for anything else than teaching. Their fellows and teachers in China only teach between 11 and 16 hours per week, and they can spend the rest of the time preparing and evaluating lessons, advancing their careers and those of their colleagues, and supporting students and parents. And at the end of the day, 
they deliver superior results. In fact, you know, whenever high-performing countries make a choice between reducing class sizes and investing in the profession, they often go for the latter. And the most amazing thing in education is the enormous isolation that surrounds us. What makes a sharing economy so different these days? Why do we buy from a stranger through eBay or even rent our apartment through a stranger through Airbnb? We do that because previous customers tell us a lot about them. You may know about more about the person to, you rent your apartment to in the sharing economy than the teacher of your children. There's so many ways in which we can change that. Let me give you an example. In Shanghai, teachers have a digital platform where they can share their lesson plans with other teachers, and that platform is combined with reputational metrics. The more other teachers download your lessons, criticize your lessons, and improve your lessons, the more you are recognized among your peers in the profession. And at the end of the school year, your principal will not just ask you how well you taught the students in your class, but what contribution you've made to the profession. And there's nothing that drives professionalism more than someone else telling you it's done a great job. The past was about delivered wisdom, and the past was hierarchical. Students were the recipients, and teachers the dominant resource. The future is much more about user-generated wisdom. And the future is co-created. And that means we need to recognize both students and adults as resources for the co-creation of communities, for the design of learning, and for the success of students. The past was divided. You had teachers and content divided by subjects and student destinations. And the past was isolated. Now, schools are designed to keep students inside and everything else outside. And the future has to be integrated, and that means emphasizing integration of subjects, integration of students, integration of learning context. And the future is connected. That means connected with real-world context and also permeable to the rich resources of our communities. In the past, different students were taught in similar ways, and their past was curriculum centered. Uh, education now needs to embrace, and I've made that point many times already, differentiated pedagogical pract uh, practices. And you can see from the PISA data, some countries have become quite good at making uh, students, including those with an immigrant background, who are marked here in yellow, resilient to the effects of disadvantage. Look at Hong Kong, Singapore, or Estonia. Whether you are an immigrant or not, disadvantage is not an impediment to excellence in education. The goal of the past was standardization, conformity, compliance. And that the students are educated in batches of age, following the same standard curriculum, and all assessed at the same time. All the future is about ingenuity, and that is building instruction from student passions and capacities, helping students find out about their passions, helping them to find out what they become, can become good at, and also what such a social purpose. We need to understand that learning is not a place where schools are technological islands and technology is deployed mostly to support existing practices. Learning obviously is an activity. The past was interactive, the future is participant. Future schools need to be empowered and also use the potential of technologies to liberate learning from past conventions. And all of that has profound implications for teaching and teachers. The past was about prescription. The future requires an informed profession. A profession that is grounded on, in strong professional knowledge, a higher degree of professional autonomy, and also a collaborative culture. And what our analysis shows is that these play out quite differently across countries. Poland is strong on all three dimensions. The red triangle is even and large. Portugal is still rather weak on all aspects. Malaysia is strong on peer networks, but weak on autonomy. Italy is interesting. Teachers can do what they like, but their knowledge base is weak, and they tend to work in isolation. France is doing well on knowledge, but teachers don't have much discretion over their work and little access to their peers. You know, of course, you know, in most countries, you see a fair amount of informal collaboration among teachers. Teachers are generally very social people. But the kind of deeper professionalism that we are talking about is so much less frequent. Of course, there are some countries we can learn from. I'm signaling here with their flags. They stand out with a strong tradition of professional collaboration, whether it's collaborative training, 
or classroom observation. But we can do a lot better than this. The point is that the more frequently teachers say they jointly teach in a class, the more they observe other teachers' classes, the more they engage in joint activities, and the more they take part in professional collaborative learning. The more teachers are satisfied with their careers and the more effective they feel in their teaching. The point is that when teachers work in teams, they all learn from each other's practices because they can finally see those practices. They're no longer alone behind closed classroom doors. We need to shift attention from the provision of education to the outcomes and replace the current industrial work organization in education with all its administrative control and accountability is a much more professional and collaborative working norm. And again, our PISA data show that where school principals and teachers jointly play a stronger role in schools, outcomes tend to do better. Our analysis further suggests that effective governance focuses on processes, not structures. It's flexible and be able to adapt to changes and unexpected events. Work through building capacity, stakeholder involvement, and open dialogue. It takes a whole of system approach and harnesses evidence and research to inform policy and reform. The last point I really want to make is about coherence in educational reform, and that is some of the fu most fundamental challenge that faces many countries taking part in the summit. It's really important to do better with aligning policies and practices across the entire education system and over time, however difficult that is in education. And we can only achieve that in partnership. That's why holding a summit every year is so important. Powerful learning environments are constantly creating synergies and finding new ways to enhance professional, social, and other capital. And they do that with families, with communities, with higher education, with other schools, and with businesses. That requires a shared vision and clear and consistent priorities that extend across governments and across time. Performance management is always essential, and that includes appropriate targets, good real-time data, regular monitoring, incentives to reward success and aligned targets. Nothing will work without investing in frontline capacity. This is the issue around professionalization. And last but not least, it all needs to fit together in a good delivery architecture, which includes strong leadership at every level of the system, including teacher leadership, and consistency of focus and prioritization. Well, you know, none of that is easy None of that is going to be done overnight. That's why the summit takes place. And that's basically the background I wanted to provide you for this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Um, we do have some several questions from our participants. The first question asks you to explain what constitutes effective teaching and what policies do education systems need to put in place to allow for effective teaching? Well, that's a really difficult question. The only point I want to make about this is that, as we can see from the first part of my presentation, uh, it really requires a broad variety of teaching strategies. You know, if you only focus on memorization, that may have on some, some type of task. If you only focus on, you know, elaboration learning strategies, that's good for other types of tasks. But what we do actually require from teachers these days is to have a broad repertoire of teaching strategies, and understanding that different students learn differently and engaging with that diversity. And in policy terms, that really requires that teachers are empowered but also have the capacity to become designers of effective learning environments. There's no longer a one-size-fits-all solution. We really need professionals at the front line who have the capacity but also the freedom, the professional autonomy to tailor the learning strategies and design around the needs of their students and keeping in mind that the kind of things that are easy to teach and easy to test are also easy to digitize. So it's really about you know, fostering complex ways of thinking and working these days. Uh, we also have another question um, about teacher training. How can we convince teachers to participate in further training in their careers as you suggest? Isn't it adding to their workload and their already heavy schedules? 
Certainly it is, and that's true for any profession. I think there are two, two, two sides to the answer. The first is, you know, making training relevant. Much of the training that is provided these days, you know, is taking place outside of the teacher's school. It's taking place in a kind of rather academic environment, too disconnected from the real needs of teachers. I think relevance is the first thing, even more important than teaching time. The second part is, of course, you know, how can we make continual learning part of the daily work of teachers. Uh, we often define teachers to the hours they spend in the classroom, but actually, uh, if you look to the highest performing education systems, they have a much wider notion of the role of teachers. Teachers, you know, are almost also social workers. They are very much engaged in professional learning. Uh, if you are in Singapore, you know, you spend 100 hours every year advancing your career, continue to learn. You may start school with a bachelor degree, but virtually every teacher finishes with a master's degree. So teaching and learning are integrated. It's part of the working day. It's part of the design. Some of it in those countries is bought with larger classes that then free up time for teachers to do other things than teaching. But I do think that notion is important. So on the one hand, making professional learning more relevant, and on the other hand, ensuring that it's becoming part of, you know, the everyday work practice. You can no longer assume that what you learn at the beginning of your career is going to get you through uh, your life in teaching. No? Uh, you also talked about uh, vocational education, um, and a participant would like to know, uh, could you go into more detail about what you mean by vocational education is, can become a trap? Yeah, as you could see from the chart that I presented, is that in most countries, not all, but most countries, uh, we tend to redirect students from disadvantaged backgrounds into vocational programs. And that is not a good thing to do because you want to get, you know, not the best, you want the best and brightest to have access to the most advanced educational opportunities, not the wealthiest. And we, we don't seem to do a good job in many countries of this. So, there are a few countries that are exceptions to this. You know, if you look to Denmark, if you look to Switzerland and parts of Germany, there you can say actually vocational education is just another way of learning, but it's not a second class education designed for the disadvantaged. So I think the point that I really want to make here is that uh, vocational education should be is catering for a different style of learning. You know, students learn differently. Some may actually be more amenable to work and to learn in a work based context and so on but it should not be a hierarchical kind of second-class education. And that is unfortunately the case in the majority of countries. All right. Uh, another participant would like to uh, talk about the Education for 2030 project. Uh, you mentioned briefly you're looking at this, what skills uh, students will need in the future, mm -hmm. but you also talked about the attitudes and values, and mm -hmm. this participant would like to know what you mean by attitudes and values that students will need. Yeah, you know, I think this is actually it's a, it's a very difficult area, but one that becomes increasingly obvious. You know, if you think about literacy in the 20th century, it was about extracting, you know, written information that has been prepared by someone else. Uh, if you didn't know the answer to a question, you could look it up in an encyclopedia and you could trust the answer to the truth. Today, you look it up on Google and you get 50,000 answers to your question and you have to navigate information. You have to construct information. You have to triangulate different information sources. So, and that requires more than just cognitive skills. You know, the kind of, um, are you willing to engage with uh, new types of information, new types of people. Are you willing to sort of uh, persist when, um, when, when things get difficult? These things have to do with curiosity, with courage, with you know, leadership, with empathy in a broader sense. And uh, those attributes um, are becoming more central for the success of individuals. Actually, most employers are going to tell you that but they're very hard to sort of build into the instructional environment. And I can tell you that from PISA, for example, in the past we used to test individual problem-solving skills. Now we have also added collaborative problem-solving skills, looking at how well students actually are able to, you know, engage with people who are different from them to find answers to their questions. So I think those kinds of character qualities are becoming increasingly important. Now, the question of values is even more complex. And the only sort of point that I make about values here really is, 
in, in, in our interpretation values is this kind of a broader notion of empathy, sort of the, that we respect others, that we feel sort of the human uh, dignity, that we tolerate divergent thinking and divergent behavior. And I think that's something that um, uh, I know is contentious in many countries, but uh, again, you know, some countries have made those kinds of core values uh, almost the core of the instructional system. Singapore is again a good example where, you know, the primary a focus of education is not around mathematics, science, and reading, but about issues around tolerance, respect, and, and, and so on. Uh, this leads me to my next question about holistic learning. Uh, a participant would like to know what are some strategies that can be done to solicit parental involvement in student education? Yeah, I think that's a it's, a it's a good question. We see also huge differences across countries. You know, one of the things that struck me most uh, a few years ago in a PISA analysis, um, we found that when parents did nothing more than simply ask their children, you know, how was school? Basically just, you know, telling their children that what they did in school actually mattered to them. That had a bigger impact on learning outcomes and parental income. And it just highlights how important uh, uh, parental engagement is. But your question, of course, is how can we foster this? And there are different answers to this. What typically uh, is very difficult to do is, you know, just say to parents, you can come to the school and, you know, ask uh, questions on a parental evening or we involve parents in the social initiatives. That's typically not that effective. Uh, it's also difficult to engage parents, you know, in hours of homework and so on. So, um, it is really about making parents part of the pedagogical mission. I, I'll give you one example that struck me really personally. I was a couple of years ago, I was in one of the poorest provinces in um, China, in Yunnan province. And I met a teacher in a village and uh, who had, you know, ed was educating the first generation of children. And I asked her, you know, how do you bring parents along on this mission? And uh, what she told me was, uh, well, you know, I'm calling every parent about twice per week to sort of just catch up with them and give them advice on parenting, on education, on schooling. And then, then I ask her, well, you know, that must add up to a huge amount on your time. I mean, how do you find the time for this? And then she said to me, oh, well, you know, I never thought about it this way. You know, if I wouldn't have those parents all behind me, I couldn't do my job. And you have other schools where, you know, parents get every, you know, day a couple of pictures from their children in school so that they can sort of share the experience of their children and be part of this. And uh, that is is very crucial. And some countries and many schools, actually, this is what's interesting is on those kinds of things, we see more variability between schools and between countries. They've become very, very good at that. And they make pa parents an asset, not a liability for advancing learning. No? Thank you. I just got another question from a participant about ICT learning, and uh, he would like to know, how do you help bridge the gap between students who have access to ICT and those that don't in developing countries? Yeah, I must uh, honestly say we don't have that much experience on the least developed countries. Most of our experience relates to the sort of emerging countries, Indonesia, Brazil, and so on. In those countries, actually, I'm quite optimistic. We have seen, actually, that most students have actually experience and access to technology. Most students will, some students actually are more capable to uh, do reading and basic tasks on a mobile phone than they are on a book, because that's where they encounter written text. So I think in, in much of the emerging countries, um, economies, that's actually quite well in place. I'm very optimistic, actually, that the access to technology is, uh, is is very rapid. What I'm more concerned about is the cognitive strategies to manage the kind of information flows that come with this. Here, I think schools don't do a particular good job. You know, the, again, you know, managing hypertext where you have to build a mental representation of text that you don't see in front of you is a very very different set of cognitive uh, activities than reading linear text in a book. And I think while you know that. The access issue is, is probably okay. I think preparing students to engage with the digital world. You know, how do you distinguish real news from fake news? You know, how do you actually enable students to to build trust and confidence in text to triangulate information? Those are things where schools need to do a much better job. 
Uh, thank you. This leads to my next question. A uh, participant would like to know um, if you've replaced uh, critical thinking by design thinking in the collection of the core comp competencies for the 21st century, and if so, why? No, actually not. This was just sort of, um, uh, I didn't have much more, more space on the chart, but no, critical thinking remains one of the key uh, dimensions of our uh, 21st century competences. In fact, we are, we are at the moment exploring to make this the focus of our 2021 PISA assessment. So no, it's a very important part of our work. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you, Andreas, and thank you to our participants for your interest in the OECD's work on education. If you would like to find out more about PISA and the Teaching and Learning Survey, please visit our website, www.oecd.org edu. If you would also like to find out more about the International Summit on the Teaching Profession and would like to read the OECD's background report, visit the summit's website, www.istp2017.uk. This webinar has been recorded and will be made available on OECD's education website. Once again, thank you for joining us.